All right, everyone. Hello again. Thank you so much for joining me. My name is Jason Levine. Great to be back here on the stream with you again for our special Adobe Video live stream series coming to you live on Adobe Live, Behance, Creative Cloud, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter Periscope. My name is Jason Levine, Principal Evangelist for Adobe. And uh, we've got tons of stuff, tons of really cool stuff to show you over the next three days. So you're gonna be, we're gonna be back tomorrow and on Friday again. We're talking with um, Adobe, uh, Adobe product team members. We're talking with incredible customers, showcasing all the things that we would otherwise normally be showing next week at NAB. And of course, since we can't be there, we thought we'd bring it to you where you are right today, tomorrow, and Friday. So lots of really cool stuff. We've also got live interactive chats happening in all these various places. So if you really want to be where the chats are really happening, I suggest you go to behance.net slash Adobe Live, sign in with your Adobe ID, or you can go to the Premiere Pro Facebook page as well. We have tons of Adobe people in the chat moderating, answering questions, and I will be filtering your questions as well to my guest, Eric, um, because you're going to have lots of them. And the stuff that he's going to show you, if you saw the title, you know, 400 VFX shots in his indie film, this, this is one of those customer presentations that it's not only inspirational, but it, it truly makes you want to start doing the stuff you're going to see. If you've ever done any kind of compositing, if you've ever done any kind of stuff with green screen, if you've ever done anything with, you know, tracking and stuff like that, or maybe you had some intimidation or trepidation about starting to do that because you just didn't know if it was possible with a skeleton crew and minimal gear. Eric is going to dispel all those myths and, and blow your minds with some really incredible, incredible content. So without further ado, I'd like you to welcome my new friend and uh, our guest today, Eric Demusi. How's it going, Eric? Hey, good, Jason. How are you? <laughs> Doing great. And again, we are so thankful and grateful to have you on the stream today. And we're going to be talking primarily about this film that you uh, that you did called Proximity. And uh, I, you know, there's so much that I want to get into, but maybe we should just start with the trailer. That's probably a good a good place to start. Right. So kind of yeah. give everybody a taste and then we'll get into all of the uh, all the details about how you made it. So yeah, let's go ahead definitely. and do that. All right, cool. So uh, I was just asking Eric if he wanted to do the the FBE style react to your own video, but I don't want to take away from the beauty of this. So <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna roll it for you directly. So here is the trailer to Proximity. Check it out. What? You feel that? What's your name? Isaac. Cyprus. So, Isaac, can you tell us what happened that afternoon? A meteorite with smoke trailing behind it appeared over the skies of Los Angeles yesterday. Isaac, where you been? You got a minute? I want to show you something. You're saying this is real. Are you okay? You leave me, right? Where have you been for the last few days? Yesterday? Yeah, yesterday, day before. I'm not making this up. This really happened to me. Okay. You've been gone from work all week. Did you have an encounter with an extraterrestrial being? your will because we believe you have information that may be valuable to the future of our society. Keep running! When they come, we get one chance. Do you think that we were exposed to something that could have changed us? We have to be there when they come. That's a bad idea. That's way too dangerous. Do we really have another choice? I remember what it was like and I'm not going through that again. Sarah! Why didn't you take us? Oh man. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> so good. Thank you. Thank you. So awesome. And I'm telling you, I, I, I was so excited to do this presentation today because now that everyone's kind of seen the trailer, you know, with sound design, with, with grading, with just very slick editing, with all the titles and everything else in there, now actually seeing and hearing the process, this is, this is what it's all about, right? And maybe you can kind of give a little context um, as to what we're going to be looking at and where a lot of this took place and kind of the crew and stuff. And I know I've got this initial shot uh, uh, of you and your, your actors and your crew here in Costa Rica. Yeah. So this, this is, a, this is, you know, we made, we made this for a, a very, very low budget. It was very kind of guerrilla style and, and, you know, very few people on the crew. And, um, you know, I hear a lot of, I've worked as an animator, uh, you know, for the last 10 years. And I, you know, I, I work with a lot of people that are working on their own projects and, and I just wanted to sort of show some of the, some of the process as much as I can right now with just being able to release the trailer of, of, of how we put some of these things together. Right. Um, yeah, some of these early shots, you know, for instance, when we were shooting in Costa Rica, we had literally three of our actors and three crew people, including myself. So right. a lot of time I'm operating camera or my DP, Jason, and then our sound guy. Um, but we are very, very skeleton crew, like just very, very minimal. Right. So, uh, so I was gonna. Some of the shots that I'm gonna talk about are shots that are in the trailer. Things that we used um, After Effects for. You know, we did 400 of the visual effects shots and composited everything in After Effects. And I think um, you know a lot of uh, you know a lot of high end visual effects. People might be afraid to to use After Effects for their primary um, application, but I've been using it for so long. There's just so much that you can do with it. Mm -hmm. So I was gonna go through and and. You know, a lot of the a lot of the visual effects. There's different types. There's you know the, the type of visual effects that are invisible visual effects, and the it, it, you know stuff that you don't normally know is a visual effect, and then things right. that are, are are visible. So this shot right here, this is actually a, a piece of the movie here, right? As we're shooting in Costa Rica, and and there's a an invisible effect going on here um, that when you watch the first time, you probably may not notice. People may think you know maybe it's like a, a matte painting or something in the background. Right. But this is actually it's actually our actor is talking to nobody because we're you know, we're so small. We, we didn't have, you know, extras and we were going around Costa Rica, um, you know, trying to get into certain um, businesses, asking if we could film there. Right. And, uh, you know, we're trying to find extras on the day. You know, we're going into places and, and asking if people can come be a part of it. And we found some for some scenes and some we didn't. So. You know, having having a knowledge of, of how to composite and, 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 you know, doing your own visual effects, you can kind of be on the fly with stuff and, and figure out a way to still complete the scene um, while, you know, while you're shooting. So the idea there is like we had the actor just go to the end of the dock and just start talking to nobody. And then when we got back to L.A., we just shot some actors in a parking lot against green screen um, and then composited them into the shot. So also, you know, they were supposed to, in that scene, they're like hitching a ride um, on the seaplane, like bargaining with this guy. And, you know, we don't have a seaplane there. We don't have right. any of the other actors. So, right. um, so we, you know, we, we put in a CG plane, you know, that's supposed to be there at the end of the dock. And this is, uh, you know, in, in, um, in premiere, uh, that was uh, us just like roughing it in. So like for all the visual effects, that are done, like even for that. So there's like, you know, three different guys that are supposed to be in the scene, um, roughing it out in, in premiere first uh, to right. get, you know, the, the correct length of all the shots and, and uh, doing like the very like cheap, fast version of it because, uh, you know, it's, we gotta be able to show a rough cut to people. So it has to make sense. We can't just have the actor standing there talking to nobody. Right. So roughing it in, and then this is in After Effects, like going in and, and finalizing the shot here. Which is awesome. And it's it's cool to see like that you were using the ultra key to do that in Premiere, just like, again, as a quick kind of proof of concept if it was going to work. And like you said, if the yeah. lighting was correct and all those elements to kind of bring it all together. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, just doing the very, very fast. So this is, this is another scene um, in the movie, and, and this is probably... You know, there, there's some visual effects going on, but, you know, if you just watch it through, um, I could show, 
This is another example of, of some invisible effects. So, so it's actually the helicopter shots in here. Like we have this in the script that there's this agency is supposed to be searching for these for these characters. And you know, I had this in the cut for the longest time. Right. Which is like some very rough, rudimentary wireframe thing that I put in just for temp. And you know, right. producers would see this and go like, "Why are we doing like visual effects for like?" Hell, like you're gonna do a full CG helicopter. Like no, 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 no. Right. It's gonna be like a very simple thing, and so just putting this in there to rough it in. But then, like the actual way that we did it was literally like just getting my DP, and we went to like an empty parking lot, and we just had him looking out the back of the car, and I have like this flag uh, put into like a drill bit to like mimic uh, helicopter blades. Right. And we're literally just in some parking lot and he's got like fake SWAT gear on that we got off Amazon and, you know, acting like he's looking out. And then we got a, a piece of stock footage that we put in the background to look like uh, to, that, that's aerial footage. So, so we match it up. And then, um, and then all we're doing from here is just rotoing the guy out, uh, adding a little bit of like depth of field um, but this is just one of those things that it's like a very simple shot like that. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a pretty simple trick, but when you start combining all that stuff together, um, in the movie, this is probably a shot that people wouldn't recognize as a visual effect, but, right. um, but it just kind of adds to, adds to the production value and, and kind of makes it you know, seem like it's a little bit bigger than it is. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, and the funny thing is you're talking about like the, the, the rotor blades and everything. I mean, even seeing that when you first showed us kind of the treatment there, the, nothing in my mind was like, uh, again, I'm thinking I knew you said it was sort of low budget, but I'm thinking, all right, I guess they I guess they did it somehow. You know, I mean, it, it yeah. didn't occur to me that that was completely, completely done after the fact, you know? Yeah, yeah. We were. Gonna, it should we have been. Gonna... I was mad at myself for not recognizing <laughs> that it should have been done. You know, that it was we done were actually, I mean, we were going to try to get a real helicopter because like even the shot where he's in the, where, where you see the, the pilot, like he's just in the front seat of a car. Right. But we were going to at least try to get a helicopter that's parked and do the green screen. Right. But it was just, it was us. Even that was outside of our budget, even with connections that we had. So it was just like, all right, all we need is just a close up, like you just, you cheat it, just very cropped and you know, you don't need to see a lot of it. Um, right. And this is another, so this is yeah, like- This this was this amazing day, and th this story, cause like and the way that you phrased this to me the other day, you're like, yeah, you know, Costa yeah. Rica guys with big guns, like standing on a mountain, not yeah, super yeah, yeah. safe, like not a great well, this idea. Is, this is like on the side of a highway. So it's right. like, for one, we were running out of daylight when we were shooting this scene and so and the other thing is like the guys that had to get in that SWAT gear is like you have to put on this SWAT gear and you have to hold these guns and you're on the side of a highway and so it was not like the most comfortable setting so I just <laughs> in the moment thought I'll, I'll just snag some like plates uh, and then I can add these guys in later so here we are shooting a, on a completely different shoot day we had a little bit of time at the end so and we had the the SWAT costumes with us so I just had them throw this stuff on and they're standing on top of a U-Haul van and I just used the the sky as like a as a blue screen or, right. or, or a keyer. Right. And then uh, and then yeah, it's just tracking them in and and um, keying out the the plants and bushes, but this is again, you know, doing the the very rough crude version in Premiere first. That way all the timing and stuff is worked out so that when we're exporting the plates for Premiere uh, for After Effects uh, we know exactly like the timing and all that of it. So now you're getting a lot of questions. I'm going to switch to our little two of view for a second here. You get a lot of questions about like lighting and environment, because obviously you were just saying like, as you were shooting, you were losing daylight. And if you look at that finished version, yeah, I mean, it, clearly it's like past golden hour yet when you were shooting yeah. in brighter daylight, cause you were actually leveraging the kind of blown out sky, like you said, as a, as a, a for chroma key purposes, how much, how much pre-production in your mind are you going, all right, I know exactly what I need to do to make this right in terms of like shadow on the faces and things like that? Or I mean, are you, yeah. are you thinking that ahead of time or do you just like, ah, we'll, <laughs> we'll we'll get it, we'll fix it later. We're not going to worry too much about it. Because obviously no. you're, you're, you're on a time crunch too, I imagine, with a lot of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I mean, for that, for those kind of things, I'm not thinking about it ahead of time. The only thing that I'm thinking about is I know... I know that I had shot those plates and I know what the lighting condition was while we shot those plates. And I knew that it just needed to be diffused lighting. So 
when we shot that with them standing on top of the U-Haul truck, you know, we had, uh, it was toward the end of the day, the sun was still out, but we had, we were right next to a building, so it was casting shadow over the top of them. So I knew that the lighting was going to match in that case. But, and, you know, we, we did a lot of this kind of stuff too. Like, for instance, in Costa Rica, because we only had three of our actors, uh, there was a lot of that where I was, I knew that we, in order to be able to afford to shoot, to shoot in the real place, right. I had to sacrifice like how many people that we could bring. So I knew for some of the stuff, I needed to shoot plates so that I could insert these people later on. So we would get lighting references, you know, we'd get plates for if we were in a certain location and we'd get pictures of what the lighting looked like and what the reflections look like. And then, uh, you know, if we'd go shoot on like a green screen or something, I would know exactly where the lights were and I'd have, I'd print out um, images. So, and, and we'd also have a stand in, like we'd shoot the plate right. and we'd shoot that, uh, shoot somebody in the lighting scenario so that we mm. knew uh, what it was supposed to look like. Um, and these, so this, this one stuff that you're playing right now, like these are, yeah. uh, um, these are obvious visual effects. Like when, right. when you see something in a movie and you go like, oh, it's a, it's a visual effect. Obvious, um, but looking slick as hell, man. I mean, they look, <laughs> they look great. They don't, you uh, know. Thanks. Yes, I don't. I don't believe that there was a you know meteorite falling from yeah, the sky. Yeah. But yet again, lighting, grading, all of these elements, and and I watch. You're, yeah. I know you're going to talk about it, but just it's so interesting. Like specifically with the smoke and how you got that particular, very billowing, natural, multicolored look. It's it's a it's a big process, right? Yeah, and you know that shot, this one here, was something that I did early on, and I had to do. You know, a lot of these shots I had to do very quickly, and so. With this, uh, it, like I was very, very basic in terms of like volumetric, um, uh, uh, like doing doing actual volumetric clouds and stuff. Right. So the only way that I could do this quickly was to actually just use a bunch of like stock elements. So this was the comp, and you could see earlier before this is that uh, all the shots that we're doing, like we're actually doing the shots with the color raw right. plate, and then outputting that same thing so that in the grade we have all the control for color but so i was going in and adding the the 3d uh planes but then you know and all the smoke trails so this stuff is just done in after effects using uh particular there it's very minimal in the in the finished shot but the uh, the actual billow like the smoke billow um that was just done using uh like a bunch of stock um uh, stock like smoke clouds and stuff. And I know there's a lot of, a lot of packages for this stuff online. So all I'm doing here is taking like a bunch of different smoke assets and basically just combining them all together as you would like a map painting or something, but it's a moving right. map painting. Right. So, and it's just taking all the different pieces and putting them on top of each other, adjusting the levels, the brightness, the color to try to make it look like some kind of volumetric cloud. And then, once you're done making it look right, they're all moving. So it's it's like a moving matte painting. So you're, and that's you're getting a ton of questions here about like, is this something that you first of all, people are just minds are blown. But are you is this something that you've done a lot of before? I mean, obviously you do visual effects, but like this specific kind of thing working with all because for me, it's amazing to hear that you use stock you know, stock smoke shot on black or what, you know, like different yeah, things yeah. like that to create these elements and make them look so believable. Something that you've done a lot of, or did you do some research on this or how, kind of? Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I had done a lot of this stuff for uh, my previous short film. So all, all my previous shorts, I would do my own visual effects. And I had, you know, there's certain like tricks and stuff that I know about. And I'd done a lot of this type of stuff, but um, on this movie, like we really kind of stepped up in terms of like the, the approach that we took to a lot of the visual effects. So right. the meteor itself, like that's a volumetric uh, simulation, but something like this, that's a little bit further off in the distance and there's not a lot of 3d parallax. Right. Um, it's something that you could get away with as basically a, a moving map painting. So, right. Um, but yeah, it was just, uh, you know, knowing kind of what you know how to do in certain software and, and, using that to to complete the shot yeah, whatever whatever it is i mean everybody kind of has their own way of doing stuff and if you can take that tool set and figure out a way to apply it to what you want to achieve i think you'll figure out a way to, to get it done and i think that's actually a really great point to make is that everybody has their own way of doing it there's no there's no there's no set rule around this 
What you yeah. Mean? Oh, this one has sound. Oh, we're back at the trailer. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. So, you know, um, you kind of, you don't, you, I mean, you can model it after maybe some, someone the way that you know someone did it, but ultimately you're going to use the tools and the things and the effects and the plugins that you have at hand to kind of achieve that goal. And I think that's one of the things that some people get, I mean, even for me, a little intimidated by like, what is the way to do it? You know, how yeah. would I, what's, do I Google how to create that volumetric look immediately? And it's like, okay, here's yeah. the way, the way Th there isn't the way yeah. it's, it's whatever. Yeah, works. no, there's, there's not. And I think, um, you know, if you have some kind of basic knowledge of, you know, compositing or doing visual effects work or graphics, it's like, how can you use those tools that you know, and the things that you have available to you to make the project that you want? Like, um, and it's great to, to look for tutorials and figure out new stuff and, and, and do new ways of learning. But I think, I know for me earlier on, like, you know, there was um, doing creature effects and stuff. Like if I didn't know how to actually model and rig and animate a full creature, I wouldn't even do it. But like, if you could figure right. out another way to do it, maybe it's a puppet, maybe it's like some practical way to do it. Right. Cause you know how to like remove wires from a scene. So like you could do it with puppetry or something like that. Um, yeah, just figuring out the way that the thing that you know how to do and figuring out a way to apply that to whatever it is that you want to make. And a lot of the shots in here, like I said, like there are some more complex stuff. Like we do have a full CG creature in the movie, um, but there's a, a lot of the stuff are these like invisible type of effects where it's like when you're on such a low budget and you're just like run and gun shooting um, and you're, you know, you're low on resources and you don't have enough people on set and uh, you know, being able to call back on the things that you know how to do and figure out a way to still complete it, um, I think is is helpful when you're going in to make, you know, your shooting or making your own project, whatever it is. So now let's talk a little bit about production time, because I'm curious as to how long you were sort of on set. Down. Was this was all of the shot? I mean, all of the primary shot down in Costa Rica and you kind of just did all of the, the inserts? No, we... We only shot in Costa Rica for about six days. The majority okay. of it was shot in Los Angeles. Uh, we shot a little bit in Washington, a little bit in Northern California. Oh, but, okay. uh, so, so but yeah, primarily yeah. Costa Rica was like, it's a, it's a, it's a small section in the movie, but um, just using that as an example of like, I mean, producers, when I said that we really wanted to go to Costa Rica, like they <laughs> thought I was crazy because it's right. like, it's, we're so low budget. Like we can't bring everybody right. down there. Like you start talking about like, plane tickets and putting people in hotels and it's like and you don't you've never been there you don't speak spanish like it just sounds right. crazy <laughs> so but uh but I, I knew it was like you know we have a section that takes place in costa rica you point the camera anywhere there and it looks like costa rica there's right. like no other way to fake it right. so um but knowing you know knowing that we could insert you know certain people into the scenes in a clever way that was the thing that i had to figure out it's like how could we make some of it that people aren't, aren't primarily like the primary actors can go down, but like the actors that have small parts there, like how can we still make it look like they're there even right. though they're not right. stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of, again, that's just what blew me away with this because knowing what you're going to be talking about and seeing, <clears throat> seeing those, those just the dailies and those shots. I mean, you know, I don't, I don't, I talk to a lot of our users who do stuff like different types of compositing and work a lot with green screen and, you know, similar sorts of things. And there's always that, how, how much can I get away with when I, when I need, like, what do I absolutely need? Right. Yeah. And then the rest you, you can kind of, again, you're kind of using all the tools in the toolbox at that point. Right. Yeah. 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 I mean, I would be, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, go too crazy on relying on, you know, fixing it in post type of deal. But I think right. like as a last ditch resort, um, you know, it, it's it, like, there's, it's so much different making movies now than it used to be um, with just with all the stuff that's available to us. And I think, you know, an easy way to composite. I mean, you just think about something as simple as green screening something or compositing something in After Effects versus how it was done in the beginning oh, yeah. with like optical printers and like it was a right. major ordeal just to right. insert one image on top of another whereas like now it's like you can do that in instagram you can like right. Put, right put something on top Zoom of the calls. story it's like right yeah, yeah, yeah it's like no big deal so yeah so, it's, it's totally different 
So, uh, and by the way, a couple people, including me and Steve, were, were commenting on your 2001 poster behind you. So a little, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. little, little Stanley Cooper glove there. So, and that kind of yeah. leads to a couple <laughs> questions that people are asking. So just kind of looking at the trailer, what were, do you have any particular uh, directors or sort of VFX people that you've kind of been inspired by or modeled some of your, the look of some of the things that you do after? Um, I mean, there's, uh, there's so many, uh, so many, uh, so many inspirations it's hard to list i mean there's like literally tons it would be like i mean every there's there's so many for right. different parts and i think it's like right. just, it's a culmination of everything that i love about movies and um uh you know star wars is a huge inspiration for me sure. george lucas but like all of his work um is that what kind of uh, got you into wanting to do sort of visual effects and composite? Like where, where, what was your sort of, what was your origin, the beget your origin story in terms of filmmaking? Um, visual effects, I feel like the first movie that really got me really interested in visual effects is probably actually The Matrix. Like oh, seeing right. the bullet time Oh yeah, I knew, and, yes, of course, yeah. Like that, to me, that was like magic. Like, wait, how can you film somebody? How can the camera be moving, but somebody is stationary? Right, like, right, that was right. like- And that was what, 99, uh, the first Matrix movie? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. That was like an actual magic trick. But um but yeah, I just started getting into that stuff and like, you know, back in the day looking at tutorials of I made like two 20-minute Star Wars uh, short films in high school and <laughs> you know, looking at like how to do lightsabers using I was going to uh, say were you wielding a lightsaber? That's the first question that came to me. Right? <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking of that scene of in Arrested Development where he's, you know, Yeah, mm, as many people retainer mm -hmm. lightsaber yeah, right. yeah, exactly. And yeah. Uh, so, yeah, and back then it was like doing, you know, rotoscoping in uh, Photoshop. It was right. like you'd export a Frame. little clip yeah. using, uh, using a, a film strip and mm -hmm. then you bring it in and like roto the blade and then add right. the glow effect on top of it. Right. Um, but yeah, and it was just like learning that stuff because it was like I wanted to put those types of things in the things that I was making, short films and skits and all that. Right. And um, so I just slowly started learning that stuff. But uh, but yeah, it was always like the back then it was like Premiere and Photoshop were like my my jam. I would do all the graphics and, and visual effects with, with those two. Yeah. So now how much how much would you say today? Uh, so this is something that came up yesterday when we were talking with Bob Lindemann from USA Today. And he made a comment about how. And he's been doing this a long time, and he puts together these daily videos called Just the Facts, sort of, you know, um, testimonials on various things that are happening around the world, you know, news, brief news stories. And one comment he made was that he's he's still learning something every day, like every every production, which they're just knocking out. There's always something new to learn. There's always something new to introduce to make it faster, more efficient, some new visual way of doing something. How much of I mean, do you experience that, too, in what you're doing, obviously? Um, well, I mean, I've been thinking of ways because I think I feel like I feel like visual effects and tech. I feel like there's such a long way to go with with uh, with technology in terms mm -hmm. of making visual effects, uh, streamlining the process of visual effects. Right. I mean, just thinking about like what a camera is capable of doing in the future is like blows my mind because it's it's like a computer, whereas right. it used to just be this analog machine that ran film strip through it. Right. But now it's like it can pick up so much more information. And I feel like we're just at the cusp of like how much a camera will be able to do. And being able to plug that into the visual effects pipeline, I think, is going to be pretty crazy. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think about technology and just um, I feel like all the technology that's in, invented for film production or, or post is like invented by necessity. It's kind of. There's a need for something, and it's not it's not readily available yet. So somebody figures out a way to do it, right. and and invent it, and then they can share it with everybody else. But uh, so that kind yeah. of segues nicely into my next question. So now, was this was this film shot presumably uh, in 4K or two, actually? I'm looking at this one cut right here. It's like 24, so like 2K or what was it? What did you shoot it on, and what what uh, cameras did you shoot it with? We uh, we finished it in 4K, but we actually we shot with um, we shot with a few different types of red cameras because it was over the course of a, a, like the process was kind of long, so there was always new cameras coming out. Um, we shot some of it in 8K, we shot some of it in like 6K and 5K. I mean, 
Nice. The only reason that we shot in 8K is because with those cameras, reframing uh, and everything, and yeah. Well, and also the 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 sensor size. So if you don't shoot in 8K, you don't use the entire sensor. So like, for people that are like familiar with the lenses and stuff, like if you were to put like a 50 millimeter lens on a camera that's not shooting full frame, you're going right. to end up with like a 75 millimeter right. like punch punch in. Right. So. So it was like shooting at these high high resolutions, but at a lower compression rate. So we ended up somewhere around 5K. But oh, um, nice. but yeah, we used uh, the red camera for 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 the movie for everything. Nice. Um, so now, are you? Uh, you probably heard now. I can't remember which. I don't know if it's HTC or maybe it's Samsung with these like 8K cameras on the on the phone. What do you think oh, about well. <laughs> that in terms of like one? usefulness and two if that in any way changes or maybe helps augments the kind of stuff you're doing um and have you ever used phones on any of your productions curiously uh mm, actually well no we we used a phone for some shots it was actually there's like a couple shots that are supposed to look like they're um filmed from like a laptop um and so, like, we, you know, I just take just to get like a lower quality. I would just take my phone and shoot it. Mm-hmm. But um, and like behind the scenes, you know, people would just be shooting with phone. But um, I don't know. I mean, high resolution is uh, it's. I feel like it's it's. I, I guess this is a, a discussion a lot of people have about cameras. But to me, it's more about the image quality than it is about like how big the resolution is. Right. Um, <laughs> Uh, Cause even like, even if you're shooting 8k and you're planning on like cropping in, like you're still gonna, you're still gonna lose. You can kind of tell, like if you crop in too much, like even if you're going to like 2k and you're blowing it up a hundred percent, like you'll still be able to see like some imperfections and right. some grain and like, yeah, it'll Just still digi- look kind digital of digital artifacting. Right. Yeah. 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 It looks a little bit dirty still, but, um, so and, I, and I how know. and how much of that? So that's that's a, that's a good point though. But how much of that? Because I'm I've noticed recently, like my I have young kids, they're always watching YouTube and they're like making me watch these things because they're kind of both into now doing green screen stuff and very basic compositing, and a lot of the stuff is very clearly like you know an S10 or an iPhone 11, and it's yeah. dirty. It is. It's yeah. like dirty and kind of gritty. How much of that do you think? Much like the jump cut becoming very the norm stylistic, like in that environment, obviously, I mean, you see some of it in Hollywood, but like jump cut not so long ago was like, it was like a comic sans faux pas, right? You know, if you were doing stuff with jump cuts, that's why we made morph cut, right? To like smooth those transitions. So what do you think about that, about like that, the digital noise and the kind of grit of the output that's not as high quality, that's significantly more compressed. Do you feel that you see that I, get, I don't know, I feel changing like things or is it, is it good or is it like, yeah, should, it's whatever it is and it's just a different kind of thing? Or, I mean, do you, do you see yeah. yourself in, embracing that in any way? Or you, you think of the kind of stuff you do, like you said, you're, go, you're going for detail and quality over, you know, frame size and, and all that other stuff. Yeah, I think, um, I think it depends on like, as long as it's a good story and like, there's right. so much content people watch you know like you said youtube videos like just it could just be a a person vlogging about something but if they're like an interesting person and you like watching them then it's like entertaining and it's the same thing with like a television show if you like a character you're going to watch them because you want to see what they do on the next episode or whatever it is so i think if the if the if the story is there it doesn't matter as much but I also think the format should match the content. So right. if, you know, if it's, uh, you know, a movie that takes place in like, you know, the sixties, right. You may not need to shoot it on film, but like having a filmic look to the final sure. image, it's going to sell nice the because, feeling. It's going to sell the vibe. Yeah. Yeah. It'll kind of ground the story a little bit more realistically in that time period. And so I think it depends. Um, you know, and, and yeah, if it's if it's something that's designed to be like cell phone. I mean, there's movies that take place entirely on a computer screen now. Right. That I've seen. Right. So, right. Like, yeah, I mean, it's like there's so many inventive ways that people could do stuff. I mean, it's kind of like what's the next Blair Witch Project going right. to be? You know, oh, is that's... it going to be something with some kind of, of the technology that's out now? 
That's so funny that you mentioned that because, yeah, that seems and it's funny. So for those who don't remember, like Blair Witch, and again, that's is that also 99? That's like pre millennium, right? I think. Yeah, it's I right think, around I think that it time. Was. Yeah, yeah. 98, 99. Yeah. Uh, if you haven't seen it, it's it's a horror film done sort of like first person shooter style, very shaky, you know, no, no warp stabilizer implemented there. <laughs> um, half of it looks yeah. like it's shot on like VHS, let alone DV cam or whatever it actually was shot on. But yeah. it, it raises an interesting point, too, because and what you were just talking about with, you know, it should fit the style. So, again, for horror. And part of why that probably just blew up and became so huge, it worked. It was like, oh, it's dirty and grainy yeah. and, you know, not finessed. And it was creepy because half the movie was just in total darkness, right? Which is kind of yeah. sold it. I just And it was these... like, oh, yeah, go ahead, it was go these ahead. like un- unknown documentary filmmakers. So it's right. like, th- these are just some like scrappy college students that are trying to right. put together some documentary about like a rumor of a witch in the woods. Right. Right. And it's very believable because of that, you know? Right. And I always so, forgot, yeah. this isn't a spoiler because it's 21 years ago, but right, that was, it was, there was a mystique about it, right? Like, was this real? Like, what, was yeah. it a documentary or was it a shockumentary? You know? Like, yeah. Well, that was, it, it was say. like a hoax. In it a was way, a hoax, like, right. People thought it was like a real thing and they're going to the theaters thinking like this, that was the, the found footage right. came from that movie because that's right. where they said, you know, this footage was found in this like old collapsed house and. Right. Yeah. So it was weird. <laughs> but but I love what you said about you know the, the the medium. It should the medium should kind of follow what the story the story that you're telling because I did recently see. I'm trying to think of what what it was. Again, Sun showed me something on YouTube and it was sort of a a cut scene where they were going back to the '60s. And in the in the description, the, this whole film it was pretty cool. It was like shot again like red. I think it wasn't weapon. So maybe it was the the 6K version. I can't remember which. I'm forgetting all the various red names, but I think it was shot Gemini or something shot in 6K. So they had sort of, you know, 2019 scenes and then they're flashing back 50 years to 1969. And to your point, they didn't, first of all, they didn't like add any grain overlay or anything like that. All right, that's fine. And costume wise, Yeah, everybody was in bell bottoms, but it was clearly like, you know, bell bottoms from Tilly's or Macy's or something new. Like it wasn't, you know, you know, and the set design was a little lacking. You saw some old cars and it was fine, but there was just something that wasn't I couldn't get sold on the flashback because it just looked too new right it just yeah the time period felt too modern it it felt too modern even though they you know it's like somebody had a cell phone in the scene no absolutely not and you know yeah if anything there's like you know i think there was some scene where they they cut to someone watching an old you know tube television like an old sony with bunny ears and it was like a smoking commercial which they probably licensed you know so that that was like a cool little element but yeah Yeah. like to your point it just the i wasn't been i wasn't sold on the flashback because i thought oh okay i guess these these people just like dressing like hippies, like I did when I was 17, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. But just too, it was too 6K. Whereas if you look at something like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, yeah, I, think, yeah, I mean, and this is a Quentin Tarantino thing anyway, but yeah, you, you definitely, yeah. you feel, you feel the celluloid in a lot of those films. Of yeah. Because right? it's, that's kind of part of it. You can smell it, right? You can, yeah, you can and smell it's the, the time it's the, period. It's the production design, the costumes, the lighting, the color palettes, like there's so much. Um, but yeah, the format helps a lot. Um, but what's interesting on Knives Out, the movie that just came out recently, they shot that uh, digitally. Ryan Johnson wanted it to be, you know, this uh, um, wanted it to look like film, but right. they just they shot it digitally, and then in post they went in and added like some gate leave and some right. uh, grain <laughs> on top of it and stuff like that because it was right. like just the process of shooting digitally is so much more streamlined. There's so much more that you can right. do with it. The options are are greater if you're shooting in digital totally. and you can always make it look like film um, by, you know, either you can add, you can, there's so many uh, filters you can add to your actual camera lens too. If you want a little bit oh, of like yeah. diffuse and glow and stuff oh, like that. Totally. Yeah. 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 So, it's funny. But I, and I always, I hear this a lot cause I, I do a lot of audio work and like how for years, even in the early digital days, but in the, certainly in the, the end of the analog era, late nineties, you know, the goal was always remove hiss, remove noise, remove all, all, all of the imperfections of the medium, right? And then now you cut to 20 some years later, and it's like, let, we want to actually put that back in. You know, there's like a ton of plugins that simulate bouncing to two inch tape or two track tape, yeah. rather, you know, quarter inch tape. 
the Abbey Road uh, J37 tape machine to add hiss and saturation and wow and flutter, the, you know, the audio equivalents of gate weave and scratches yeah. and all these things. And just that, like we're adding stuff back into an 8K, 6K master to look vintage, to look dirty and gritty, even if it's not yeah. a period piece in some cases, right? You see yeah. that a lot where just That's... even it, like title design uses that as just to, to give you a feeling. Yeah, it's that's what we're so used to recognizing as a movie. Like a movie has a certain look to it. It's 24 frames a second. It's shot on film. Um, it's wide frame a lot of time. And so, yeah, there's a certain look. And I think people are still trying to achieve that. But if everything just switched over digitally, it was completely pure and clean right now. People growing up now would probably not know any difference. And to them, a movie would be 30 frames a second or whatever they're used to watching, whatever format. Right. So it's, yeah, it's, it's weird. It's just, uh, that's what a movie looks like. So that's what we right. try to do now. Right. And it's just that constant reimagination of the medium, right? And I think that this, this film, which yeah. by the way, now you had a May, was it a May 15 release date? Is that still yeah. the anticipation? Yeah, May 15. Oh. Yeah, we had a day and date release. So meaning that we had a, a limited, uh, limited theatrical release with uh, digital uh, and on demand. But, you know, theaters, we're not sure if theaters are going to be open by then, right. sounding like probably not, but it'll still be available for everybody to watch from home. So that's awesome. Yeah, so it's still still got the May 15th uh, available digitally. Sweet, dude. Yeah. Well, Eric, thank yeah. you. So this has been so awesome. We could be chatting forever, but yeah. unfortunately, we are out of time. So again, I want to thank you so much for joining us on this very special live stream series. I want to remind everybody that we'll be back tomorrow at, uh, at 9.30 a.m. on Adobe Live. Behance, Facebook, Twitter Periscope, and YouTube. So uh, from Eric and myself, thank you so much for joining us. I want to thank all of my Adobe colleagues in the chats for answering all those questions. And again, Eric, people are just blowing it up. I mean, they, they loved this and they're laughing. And someone said that uh, feel the celluloid, who just said that, should be on a T-shirt. I love that. So <laughs> feel that nice. My, my next shirt. All right, everyone, yes. thank you so much. We've got cool. more Adobe Live stuff coming up for you. So stick around. Have a great rest of your day afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world, and we'll see you again next time. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.